Good morning, everyone. I'm Jamie Duthie. I'm the Vice President of Investor Relations and Strategic Development at the Wichita Chamber. Thank you for joining us this morning to learn more about the Nexus Health Insurance Program. Um, the Chamber started looking at health insurance benefits a couple years ago to help small businesses uh, be more competitive uh, when they're hiring talent and also to help employers uh, hopefully save money on their health insurance uh, costs, which we know are very significant in the grand scheme of their business operations. Uh, before I introduce our guests this morning, I wanna remind everyone that we're recording today's webinar and all of our attendees are muted right now. So you wanna use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout the discussion. Uh, Rick Benz is joining us this morning and he's an employee benefits consultant with USI Insurance Services. He's here today to give us an overview of the Nexus program. Thanks for your time this morning, Rick. Yeah, no problem. Again, Rick Bynes with USI Insurance Services. As Jamie said, um, when the chamber went through their due diligence process of um, finding the right partnership with the employee benefits consultant to help them um, find and locate and bring to the table the most appropriate um, program that was the best fit for them. That's where USI came into the picture. So we're super excited to be partnering with the Chamber and helping them promote and roll out their program. We've seen a lot of great success. Um, we've had a lot of great feedback from the members on the program, the uniqueness of the program, some of the, um, in certain instances, some flexibility with the program. And we're seeing the cost um, come in for these particular platforms be it traditionally be anywhere between five to 12 percent less than what you're seeing out there in the tra traditional fully insured market so it's it's been working <laughs> and uh, uh it's been a great great program and we're excited or i'm excited to share with you all today just a little bit more about it um i don't think we have a ton of people participating today so I would encourage you to use the chat function um, and let us know if you have any questions and we'll be able to answer those. And likely I'll have Jamie jump in too. I'll kind of speak through a few slides and then have Jamie maybe have me pause for a second and see if there's any questions or Jamie's seen me give this presentation a number of times. So she knows sometimes some things that I may not have built into the presentation, but are always good points to make sure that we visit about so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and pull up the actual presentation. So can everyone see the screen, see the presentation? Yeah, Very we good. can see it, Rick. Very good. Okay, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, with any group health insurance plan, you're always looking for unique ways to structure the program. So it benefits um, the members participating in the program in the long run. It's structured for long-term success, and it has some components built into it that are going to benefit everybody involved. So it's going to benefit the providers, the employers and the employees who are all working together to at the end of the day, lower um, the overall health insurance cost. So Jamie talked a little bit about this at the beginning. I think everyone on the call understands exactly what the problem is. You know, group health insurance costs are continuing to rise and um, they've been rising anywhere from 6% um, to 12%, depending on what region of the country you're in on a year-to-year -year basis, and simply that type of trend is not sustainable. So um, that's one of the reasons, like Jamie said, that they wanted to have um, a program built out for their members to help them lower their cost. A fragmented healthcare system, really what that means is in today's world in the healthcare system, you see a lot of people out there who are having to navigate care on their own. And when they're doing that, they often are taking direction from a number of different providers and physicians. So you may have a spe specialist prescribing a drug, 
You may have your primary care physician prescribing a drug. You may be getting direction from your specialist on where to go and seek care. Your primary care physician may be giving you some advice on where to go seek care. So everything's very fragmented. And in, in those particular instances, what you can often see is the member losing out in that particular dynamic as sometimes they may be taking conflicting drugs um, that are making them not be as healthy as they should be or making them feel poorly or they're going to providers that aren't of the highest quality and lowest cost. So the platform that we've built for the chamber program is going to um, bring all that together to where it's more streamlined and is a better long-term strategy and approach to the health insurance program. Increased number of claims over a million dollars. So this is not specific to the chamber program itself. This is just in the marketplace in general. So be it um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, United Healthcare, Cigna, Aetna, Humana, whoever it may be out there, they're all experiencing increased numbers of claims over a million dollars. Um, I gave an example as of late. There's currently uh, an injectable drug on the market that is um, basically made available to infants who have blindness, and it actually cures blindness for, for infants. The injection itself um, is made in, into the eye. I don't know if it's into the eyeball itself, but into the eye area. The cost of that injection is $1.5 million per eye. So obviously you really can't put a price on being able to see. So, but the fact that it costs that much and for group health insurers and group health plans to take on that cost, that is uh, quite a bit to take on. That's a very extreme example. Some other examples that some people may be familiar with are your preemie babies. Um, a lot of times those can run in the, in the S, excess of a million dollars. Um, hemophiliacs, which are um, people who have a very rud, uh, rare blood disease condition, those claims run in a million dollars. So we're just starting to see the instances of claims over a million become more prevalent in the market. So these that last three bullet points, fee-for-service fee driven and no focus on improving health, not paying for value and outcomes, kind of tie back into the fragmented healthcare system. So your traditional fully insured carrier model is based on a fee-for-service driven model, which means the uh, provider or health provider has agreed to provide services at a fixed fee-for-service reimbursement with no ties to any type of focus on the actual members improved health or them um, being treated at the highest quality level based on the member getting better or their condition getting better. There's none of that that goes on today inside the traditional health insurance model. It's basically providers are getting paid based on volume not on outcomes. And when you have that place that play out in the system, what we realize all that really does is drive up costs. So the foundation that the program for the Wichita Chamber is built on is using a provider network called Nexus. And the Nexus um, provider network is actually um, a segmented layer of a network that's been in place for many, many years called the Providers Care Network. Some of you may be familiar with the old Providers Care Network that they call WPPA, which basically was evolved, has evolved into the Providers Care Network. And the Providers Care Network actually created this Nexus model. The Providers Care Network and the Nexus um, platform are actually started and owned by physicians. So the network is built by a group of physicians and owned by a group of physicians. So with their expertise and knowing what actually needs to take place to keep costs down, excuse me, this is where we've, they've developed the Nexus model. So at its core, basically what it is, is Nexus is a value-based delivery model that aligns provider and employer incentives and focuses on the cost drivers of health plans to reduce costs. So it's a collaboration between the physician, the employer, 
and the actual employee or member receiving care. So the, the core part of the savings really starts with every member selecting a primary care physician. Now they have to select and name one. The way the actual insurance product models are developed, they're not required to use the one that they select, but they definitely have to select one. And when they do use the one that they select, they're going to be incentivized by having a lower out-of-pocket responsibility or a lower copay to be driving basically their care and their navigation of their care through their primary care physician. On the provider side, what you see is members or um, the providers themselves or the primary care physicians are going to be earning incentives for better outcomes based on their actual performance. And we have a slide coming up that's going to talk about how that landscape works. So the, these particular pro providers are no longer going to be reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis. They're gonna be measured um, based on their actual outcomes of their member base that they treat. Again, the members themselves or the employees are going to have incentives for choosing a cost-effective and quality provider, which inside the uh, insurance model are identified as tier one providers. So when a member goes and sees a tier one provider, that particular out-of-pocket responsibility or copay in, in most instances is going to be lower than what it is with a two-tier a, a tier two provider. So both incentives point to the goal of providing the right care at the right place at the right time for the best possible outcomes along with highest quality, lowest cost. The other part of the program that's integrated is being able to identify and manage the high risk members inside an employer's population. So again, this, this slide just talks a little bit about why the foundation is built around choosing and assigning a primary care physician. Um, so the big um, stats here are 26% of U.S. adults don't have a primary care doctor. And if everyone in the U.S. saw a primary care doctor, it would result in a savings of $67 billion. So what the stats show is, you know, primary care physicians focus on a holistic care approach. So you get away from this fragmented care type of um, experience that the member has. You have the primary care physician who is leading, navigating um, the care that a member would get. Over time, the primary care physician gets to know a lot about their patients, obviously, because they had that relationship established. They're going to be coordinating the patient's care and helps them navigate what we call the healthcare jungle. And individuals who have a primary care physician relationship, it's just a well-known fact, spend less on healthcare. And a lot of that's driven based on the fact that they have fewer ER visits. They have fewer readmissions to the hospital they're more aware of what's going on with their help and are treating those diagnoses sooner rather than later before they become severe chronic conditions. So studies just show that individuals who have a PCP are healthier and actually live, live longer. So that's why it's the foundation of the program. Here's the slide that talks about how the um, physicians are incentivized. So the domains in which they're measured are utilization, site of service, referrals, access, and quality. So in utilization, what they're measuring are readmissions. Um, those need to be kept at a minimal number. Inpatient hospital or uh, readmissions, inpatient hospital utilization, those should be lower as well. And emergency room department utilization, those should be kept at a minimum. So basically there's a $5 per member per month incentive that's paid for the providers when they're measured in these five particular areas. And for utilization, $2 of the $5 per member per month is based on them meeting those particular parameters and incentive performance measures. Side of services, so labs and imaging. And really what this is, is as you all may or may not know, the site 
of where you have labs and imaging performed vary greatly by price depending on the site of the service. So for instance, if you do labs and imaging in an inpatient hospital saving, uh, setting, the cost for those particular items are going to be a lot more expensive than if you were to do those at a standalone um, outpatient fa lab facility or imaging facility. So what the physicians are doing is they're directing the members who need labs and imaging to those particular providers who have and provide equal or the best um, quality of lab and imaging services for the lowest cost. And when they do that, they're incentivized a dollar of the $5 per member per month. Specialist referrals, same thing. You want to be referring to specialists of the highest quality and lowest cost for those specialty, uh, specialty provider needs. Adults access to preventive and ambulatory health services and children and adolescents access to primary care providers. So that has a small incentive as well. And then the PCP engaging with the members on preventive services and those individuals who have chronic diseases are having specific outreach to them to make sure they're staying on track with those very key um, treatment regimens that are required to keep somebody with a chronic condition healthy. So on the preventive side, it's reminding people of a certain age um, that they need to be getting their annual screenings. On the chronic disease, it may be making sure and reminding um, a, a diabetic to come in and have their six month checkup. So by tying an incentive and measuring these things, it helps bring everything full circle um, to hold the PCPs um, accountable for being paid and incentivized on an outcomes basis versus a fee for service basis. And in that same, because they use that model, the members are getting better care. So let's talk a little bit about the Nexus platform. Again, it, it's, a, it's created by the Providers Care Network and it was first effective back in December, 2018. USI was fortunately, um, fortunate enough to have one of our clients be one of the first pilot clients in the Nexus platform and they had tremendous results. I think their first year renewal was like a 12% decrease. Um, and that was outside the chamber model, but still the, the overall strategy of the Nexus platform would be the same. There's approximately 1,300 employees and over 3,300 member lives currently inside the Nexus Provider Care Network. There are 332 primary care physicians currently contracting. And basically the, the Nexus part of the PPO network is built out in the counties that are directly surrounding Sedgwick County. So Sedgwick County, Harvey County, Butler County, Sumner, Cali, Keegan, Reno, and McPherson counties. Um, so that's really where the Nexus provider group is situst and basest, but that's not to say that if you have employees outside that area, there's not um, providers available to get services because there absolutely are. Um, Nexus is uh, integrated not just with the Wichita Chamber Program, there are other chamber programs in the greater Wichita area that are utilizing this um, network as well. So the McPherson Chamber, the Derby Chamber, the Heston Chamber, and there are other uh, associations here locally that are using the Nexus program as well. But overall, what we're seeing is a 15 to 1 return on investment for these members um, and for these groups who are utilizing the Nexus um, network platform. So before I get into the results, Jamie, I thought I would stop just for a second and see if there were any questions or anything that you want me to speak to prior to going into the results page. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat right now, but I would just add, you know, one unique aspect of the Nexus program that was really appealing to the Wichita Chamber is the fact that it was three local firms coming together to develop and launch the program. Um, USI being one, the Providers Care Network, which is of course based here in Wichita, and Mandova Healthcare is the administrator, 
Um, and they're a local firm who actually works all across the country with a variety of chambers and associations. Um, so we're really fortunate in Wichita that all of these uh, companies are here locally, in fact, just down the street from the chamber. So our members have um, close access to a variety of subject matter experts uh, through the program. No, that's a great point, Jamie. Very great, great point. So let's talk a little bit specifically about the results that we've seen during 2019 um, because of the Nexus program. So this particular bar chart, what it shows is the 2019 calendar year, and we're going to compare the Nexus um, per member per month spend cost versus the traditional providers care network. Um, cost. So the full-blown open providers care network, which is a very large network, network that's domiciled in the state of Kansas that has the Nexus network sitting inside of it. But if we just look at the per member per spend cost of the traditional fee-for-service model that's used by the providers care network, that per member per month spend is $348.94 per member per month. What the Nexus platform has produced is a per member per month spend of $211.97 per member per month. So that's 39% less than what the traditional fee-for-service model is producing. So we are seeing great success and great wins by the members and the providers and the employers who are utilizing a program that has the Nexus model integrated into it. So um, the savings is there and the platform is working. This slide just gives us a, a, a high level overview of some of the outcomes that are being driven by the Nexus platform. So on a savings perspective, is you know, you're measuring the medical spend for each of these categories. So you're seeing 70% savings on the readmissions piece, 32% savings on labs, 52% savings on imaging, 33% savings on specialist referrals, 41% savings on admissions, and 39% savings on emergency room visits. So again, this goes back to some of those concepts I talked about earlier and how the program is structured, you're seeing those savings play out. Again, the actual utilization is gonna be tied to this savings because the average length of stay is going to be down 15%. Your number of emissions that you have are going to be down 34%. Emergency room visits are going down 31%, and the avoidable emergency room visits are down 45%. This particular um, silo is not out of the ordinary for any employer who has a group health insurance plan. No one is on an island when it comes to this, meaning that you're always going to have certain members of your population who use the emergency room like their primary care. And if you don't have the right model in place, your health plan is always going to continue to overspend in that particular area if they're not getting the right guidance and not having the right benefits available to them. Um, so they're using lower costing, higher quality care instead of just going to the emergency room. The quality that you're seeing is increasing dramatically. Uh, diabetes is one where you see the quality measure increase by 31%. Um, and then your screenings for cervical cancer and colorectal cancer screenings, those are up as well. So again, bringing everything full circle, when you have this well-oiled machine and um, platform built out to where everyone's helping everybody and everybody's winning in every component, you're going to see the savings utilization and quality um, play out in a much better perspective. Okay. Um, so we're going to get into kind of the meat and potatoes now, which, you know, for people who are on the call today, they're like, okay, Rick, we get it. We understand. Um, but show us the meat and potatoes. So here's really the meat and potatoes. There's um, four, or there's actually 16 different plan design options that are available. 
Um, and they're category categorized, I believe, into four different buckets. So this is the healthy choice bucket that we show here. And it shows deductible levels of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and 2,500 for the single, and basically two times for family. I'm going to spend some time going through this because after I get through the deductible, the lifestyle deductible coaches, once I go through this, for the most part on the other plans as well, all of the stuff underlying is pretty much going to be the same with all the other plans. So of the 16 plans, one thing I wanted to make note of is <clears throat> as we go through those, you could definitely see, you could definitely see, sorry, my views screwed up there for a second. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll be able to basically pair any of these plans together um, from each of the segments that I'm getting ready to present <clears throat> with limitation, meaning that it's all really tied to the employer's group size. So if you're an employer who has less than 10 employees enrolled in your group health plan arrangement, you will only be able to offer one of the 16 plan designs. If you're an employer who has between 10 and 24 employees enrolled, you could offer a maximum of two plan designs. If you're an employer who has 25 to 49 employees enrolled in your group health plan, you could offer a maximum of three plan designs. And if you have 50 or more enrolled in your group health plan, you could offer a combination of four plans. The other thing, that when it comes down to the formal pricing of the arrangement, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the big key is by being a Wichita Chamber member, your pricing is already going to be discounted by 5% just by simply being a Chamber member. So that alone, depending on your group size, can um, well have its own return on investment as it relates to any membership fees that you're paying for your Wichita membership. So with that said, let's jump into some of the plan designs. Um, again, these are the uh, four healthy choice options. They're structured very similarly to what you would see with a traditional health insurance plan that's out there. I'm going to spend my time going through this healthy choice 1000 and uh, kind of go through that because I think it'll give us a, a pretty good idea of how the plan works. So again, $1,000 deductible, $2,000 for family. There's a lifestyle deductible credit. So this is a very unique benefit that was built into the program by the Wichita Chamber um, as it relates to um, engaging with wellness. So if you meet certain wellness parameters that are integrated into the program, you're going to be able to lower your deductible by $500 for single or $1,000 for family. And we'll talk about what some of those things you would need to do to meet, meet those requirements. So the co-insurance is 20% for the member after your deductible's uh, left until the member meets a $2,500 co-insurance out-of-pocket. Then once the out of, maximum out-of-pocket limit is reached, for your deductible and coinsurance of 3,500, then you'll likely just have co-pays for some of the services until your total ACA maximum out-of-pocket is met. So this is structured very similarly to some of the other traditional health plan models that you see out there in the marketplace. So none of that piece should be new. Obviously, these are non-grandfathered plan designs, so all preventive services are going to be covered at 100%. Now we're going to start to get into some of the Nexus platform integration. So for a primary care office visit, what you're going to see is a Tier 1 preferred provider is going to have a $10 copay. If it's a Tier 2 network provider, which is not a Nexus provider, but a considered more of a tier two provider, the copay is going to be $50. And then um, regardless of the uh, copay, it looks like it's 100% for the first 250, then deductible and coinsurance. 
If it's a specialist, again, tier one providers, they're going to have a $30 copay. It's going to be 50 if it's a um, tier two specialist provider. Urgent care is going to be $50 copay, then 100% to 500 per visit. Then it's going to be subject to deductible and coinsurance. Telephonic physician consultations, $0 copay. Um, what we're probably all seeing and experiencing in the current environment we're in is the, um, the utilization uptick um, around telehealth. And what we know is if you have a telehealth program built in, in, into your group health insurance plan today and there is a copay assigned to it, most likely it's not going to be nearly as utilized if you were to have a $0 copay. You want people to use this particular benefit because the cost of the actual allowed amount that is charged for a telephonic visit and consultation is going to be much less than what it would be for someone to go see their PCP brick and mortar um, or an urgent care and whatnot. So heavily promoting this particular benefit, having it at a zero dollar copay is very key. Um, outpatient lab, this particular um, benefit is structured at 100% coverage if a preferred vendor is used, which the member would definitely be able to get access to who those preferred outpatient labs are, and the PCP would be referring to those particular outpatient labs as they would know the coverage is at 100%. Otherwise, it's going to be deductible and coinsurance. The radiology and imaging, it's going to have to have a pre-certification requirement. If it's done physician freestanding, a tier one provider is going to be a tier two provider is going to have a $200 punitive copay and deductible insurance. Any hospital utilization for radiology and imaging is going to have a lower copay and deductible insurance. Patient is going to call for doing a freestanding imaging center office visit setting. So that's why the incentive um, structure in that manner. Deduct um, dietic supply, <clears throat> they're going to be covered by 100% if it's a preferred provider. Otherwise, it's a share the prescription drug um, If it's or emergency, excuse me, it's a professional certainly, it's 50 copay, then 100% 500 insurance. If it's an ambulance, emergency service, insurance, and an impact or punitive copay, and co insurance. You can see the outpatient surgical benefits. $250 copay, um, then 100% to $5,000, $10 copay and deductible and coinsurance if it's there too. So basically, the structure around surgical procedures and the imaging hospitalization with surgeon professional services are all structured to help their people toward providers that are highest quality cost. And you can see through all these plan designs with the designation of tier one provider. Down here at the bottom, you have the prescription drug benefit or for generic, preferred generic, 15 copay for non preferred generics, 50 copay for brand name drugs, 80% copay for non preferred drugs, and a 50% specialty drug. So, an international medical order. Brand benefit for zero pay, uh, and that's voluntary. In this particular arena around prescription drugs, what the done with the, they have a standalone department of people who help members. So they're having a different um, specialty co insurance, as may or may not be aware, all the drug manufacturers have no pay drug manufacturer assistance available. You just need to know how to get access to it. So the folks at Manova 
for the people who are taking specialty drugs being in a doubt and all that is this because okay cases is for almost three of the drivers out of pocket. When you do that and take a drug manufacturer assistance and it's not the dollars um, for the drug. The unique aspect of the prescription fit built chamber you as an employer have a choice to do uh, one of two things. One would be cover um, specialty medications, the full list of specialty medications, um, and there's pricing for that. Or you can exclude a particular list of specialty medications, knowing that the folks at Medova are going to help your actual members. Um, Going to help actual members um, navigate that patient system. So there are two options with the quoting process of being able to navigate that. That was a lot, Jamie. Well, are there any questions that are coming up in the chat as it relates to that? Um, I don't have any specific questions from the group. I just want to, if you could talk about, you know, when we're thinking about the different of physicians, could you talk about the scope and the inclusivity of the providers care network here in Kansas and how that compares to a Blue Cross network or an Aetna yeah. network that some of our members might be familiar with? Yeah, so the full footprint of the providers care network, um, as far as an access perspective and being able to access providers, it's going to match up very equally to what you would see with the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, an Aetna, a United Healthcare. So those particular providers that are in those networks are also going to be in the providers care network. The other, and then obviously I showed on the slide, there's like 332 contracting primary care physicians inside the Nexus platform in that seven county area. And we're only seeing that number of primary care physicians grow tremendously um, in that area to become more robust as um, the providers continue to have more um, people being treated under this particular model. I think the thing to keep in mind as well is some of you may be thinking about, oh, hey, Rick, I have a, a, a college student child of mine that is in Lawrence, Kansas, or out of state. Um, for those out of state folks, um, they're a national wraparound network that's paired to wrap around the provider's care and nexus network if you're traveling out of state, if you have to see a center of excellence like uh, MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, things of that sort, you would have the, uh, the Aetna National Wraparound Network protecting you there to get in-network coverage. So the, the footprint of provider's care is very um, broad. Um, it's very comparable to what you would see with Aetna United Healthcare and uh, across Michigan and Jesus. So the, the next page, I'll briefly go over these next um, few plan designs. This is the Healthy 100 suite. So you still have your deductibles. They're just a little bit higher, 2,500, 3,035, and 5,000. You still have the lifestyle deductible credit available, but there's no co-insurance share. So basically, you're going to see once your deductible is met, any other services that are just subject to deductible will be paid at 100%, but you'll still have co-pays that accumulate for some services that accumulate towards this ACA maximum out of pocket. The underlying benefit themselves for these services are going to fall in line and match very close to what we talked about um, with the healthy choice. So once you get to this, then everything here is going to be back as I just went through the healthy choice slide. Health value is basically um, deductible levels, 535, 68, 50, and 10, and it has a 50% co-insurance. Instead of 80, 20, or 100%, it's a 50% share. 
by 10,000 gram, it's only going to be if it's paired with a health reimbursement account. And that's a specific strategy in order to make that plan a plan. All the plans that uh, you are covered with you meet the ACA um, requirement. Down here, all this other stuff, once we get below the out of pocket max, is all the same as through on the very first. Um, um, uh, on the very first uh, uh, percent of the benefits. And then these are healthy consumers. So your qualified high deductible health plans that can be paired with a health savings account. So you can see how these are structured. Um, again, these, any pays that are talked about here after the deductible, you have to in place order the plans table to meet the IRS requirements for contributing to a savings account. So the tier really only come into play on the call health plan. And we reiterate uh, plans from each of these four as they're putting together the program, correct? Right? That's right. So you don't have when you change, have to do the same. You can pick one from Healthy Choice, one from Healthy One Hundred, one from Healthy Value, one from Healthy Consumer. You have to offer four, so you could choose from any of the four sheets of the of the benefits that were described there. So the other uniqueness of the program is it's not fully insured. So your traditional model that you see out there in the marketplace is basically teed up on a fully insured model where um, employer is going to get a monthly bill for a premium uh, that the insurance has determined at the beginning of the year that these are your four rates, your eight banded rates, and um, depending on who's enrolled in the plan, you're going to pay us that monthly premium every month. And regardless of what your claims are, you're going to continue to pay that premium every month. If you have a million dollar in claims and you only pay in two hundred thousand dollars in premium, that's that's fine. You know, you're you're subject to that. But if you pay two hundred thousand dollars in premium and have twenty five thousand dollars in claims, guess what? You're not getting back the hundred the the hundred seventy five thousand that you've overpaid. So what the the platform in which chamber program is built on is what we call a level funded platform. So really what level funded is, it's um, basically it's a hybrid between a traditional fully insured plan and a partially self-funded plan. And really what we're doing, what we do is the level funded approach is behind the scenes, you're self-funding the program but you're creating four tier rates, monthly rates. So you'll have a long employee child employee rate, an employee spouse employee rate. Those rates will be established at the maximum um, of a self-funded plan for your particular plan. So now basically, looks feels like fully insured because in essence all you're doing is paying maximum funding level that has been established for your particular group based on the risk that's in your group based on the graphics that's in your group and based on the design that you choose but upside is so the downside risk is the same because you're you've created the premium equivalent rates, level three rates, that are at your maximum exposure level that's been established for your group. So downside risk is the same as if you were fully insured. But there's upside risk to being left funded on the inside. Because once they your overall maximum exposure maximum costs are they they break into three different buckets, which is an administrative fee, 
how much um, Manitoba is going to charge, basically, to administer claims. Then you have the stop loss coverage fee, um, which is stop loss premium that's built into catastrophic claims that happen inside your group. And then the other piece of the fire of the bucket is claims. So there's upside that's created through the level funded model because what happens is if your plan from a claims perspective performs at a um, at a level that's better than what the expected claims factors that have been established for your plan are, that money stays with the employer to where when you're fully insured, if your claims run really good, you're never going to get that money back. When you're level funded, if your group performs really well, you have the opportunity to keep the dollars that are left in your claims fund after a run out period from the end of the plan year. So there's upside risk or upside gain on the claim side if your group performs at a, a, a favorable level. So Rick, with the level funded program, is it true that we're also avoiding, oh, here you go, some um, taxes? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so thank, thanks Jamie. So this kind of, gives like the eight best reasons why it makes sense to be in a level funded program versus fully insured. So you have a fixed maximum program cost. There's no downside risk. It's same as being fully insured with a health insurance carrier. You're also stripping out in some of the ACA health insurance tax, like the HIT tax. And there are other taxes that are reduced greatly because you're only paying them on the stop loss portion of the premium versus the full premium amount as a whole. Um, so by simply being in a level funded arrangement, there's a lot of uh, the cost is skimmed off right off the top because you're in a level funded arrangement. Um, annual claims reporting. Typically, when you're fully insured, there's not a lot of reporting that's made available to you. On an annual basis, you're going to see uh, a pretty in-depth and expansive reporting package that shows you what's driving your claim spend and how all that is playing out. Um, a level premium for cash flow pr predictability. So you establish those four-tier rates and you pay those every month. There's no plan termination liability at the end of the plan year, because we're establishing those four tier rates at your maximum liability at the end of the plan year. If you're like, I don't like this, this doesn't work well for me. I want to go back fully insured to blue cross. You can do so. And there's no additional dollars or funds that would be due at that time because you've already funded at the maximum. When there's an opportunity of a surplus in your claims reserve account, the employer owns 100% of those dollars. Here's another side-by-side -side comparison of some of the things you gain versus getting away from when you're fully insured. So you're, there's no age and gender limitations and there's no age banded rates. Um, the plan limitations aren't as strict. So you saw there was a lot of unique things we did inside the plan design that a fully insured metallic plan would not allow you to do. Basically, in essence, once you pay for your administration cost and once you pay for your stop loss premium, you're really only paying your claims that are being paid out. When you're in a fully insured arrangement, the underwriting methodology is structured to where at times a lot of their rate is based on the performance of the overall pool as a whole, which can impact you adversely. You can hedge premium increases um, for, pro for um, future plan years if you have good plan years preceding them, meaning you're going to have money in your claims account to help offset any potential um, premium increases you would have in the future because you ran good um, in the prior plan year, which is never going to be the case when you're fully insured. You have a, the wellness incentives. Um, and initiatives that are built out provide savings to you as the employer because you're paying out less claims. And we know when whatever claims 
dollars are left in those that account comes back to the employer. When you do wellness incentives with a fully insured carrier, you're benefiting the carrier um, on in their profit level. Premium savings opportunity if you have lower claims, which we talked about, you're never going to have that with fully insured. So a quick overview of the wellness initiatives, and I can send out um, if you'd like to see all the different platforms and initiatives that are built out through the lifestyle wellness. Obviously, the deductible credits, we talked about those. Typically, what you have to do is establish your primary care physician relationship, um, fill out, I believe, a health risk assessment, and um, have your lipid panel done and review your, soul, your results with your primary care physician. Uh, care physician. If you do those things, then you get the $500 lifestyle or the $1,000 lifestyle deductible credit. There are cash incentives built out for some of the wellness initiatives. Um, a lot of those could be related to uh, tobacco sensation and whatnot. There's a points credit match. And then there's also proactive disease management that's built into the wellness lifestyle wellness program that's integrated inside of it. There's a lot of cool stuff. Um, if you want to dig in and you're kind of a wellness geek or guru and want to know a lot more about it, just let um, Jamie and myself know and I can send you an abundance of information on the logistics of how these are integrated into the program. So eligibility and participation. So group size, the minimum group size is two. W-2 employees is the minimum group size. And when I use that terminology, what I'm saying is basically – if me and my wife have a lawn mowing business and we're the only two employees want to join the chamber and get health insurance, we can't do that because we're actually owners. You need a, a true employer employee relationship to where you have two W2 employees um, that you're going to be covering on the, under the health plan. The employer sets the number of hours of work for the health insurance eligibility. Um, so uh, it's typically 30 hours or more a week. You can set it at 20 if you want. Um, but you could definitely set that to your liking. The overall participation that's required of the group is 50% of the total eligible group based on how you set the health insurance eligibility and 75% of adjusted eligible employees means if people have valid coverage elsewhere, that wouldn't count against you and your participation requirement calculation. Underwriting guidelines. So as an employer, you're going to be required to contribute at minimum 50% of the monthly single rate cost for any participant who's enrolled in the group health plan. Now, that doesn't have to be of the richest plan. If you're big enough to offer two plans, it could be 50% of the single only rate for a lower costing plan. Every group is individually underwritten. Um, so if you're a small group, typically under 50 enrolled and you don't have access to any type of claims data, um, your members are going to be asked to complete individual health questionnaires and potentially some supplemental questionnaires if there are um, chronic diagnoses inside your group. Um, there's logistics that come with that, obviously. There's a online portal um, logistics process that can play out with those or you can do them pay with paper, or you can do a combination of both. If you're a large enough group, you can actually submit some data um, with large claims, and uh, we would send you exactly what we would need, and the program can produce your rates based on that data. If you currently have a plan, you want, we'll need a copy of your most, most recent renewal. Um, there's a confirmation letter that would need to be signed in an employer disclosure form, once the rates are finalized. The quoting process, um, you know, you're gonna need a census in an Excel format. We're gonna need these individual medical questionnaires or supplemental questionnaires. We're ha we'll need to know your current employer contribution rate, how much you're paying today if you have a group health plan as an employer, what your benefits are today if you have a um, benefit plan today and a copy of your current monthly billing. So that was a lot, and I know we're getting short on time, Jamie. So I'm just going to uh, – do you want me to go ahead and briefly go over these last two slides? Yeah, let's cover them quickly, and then um, we can wrap up and answer any questions yep. that we have from the group. 
So um, obviously USI's partnership with the chamber was being able to think outside the box and bring a couple other value added things that we know any employer out there who has a group health plan would see a great deal of benefit in. Think HR is basically a HR platform that's made available to HR professionals that's going to help them um, administer their group health plan with any questions they may have. So there's a compliance component. There's online training courses. Um, there's an HR expert live. Like if you have an awkward conversation with an employee as an HR director, you could call these people and say, I just had the most awkward conversation. I don't know what I need to do next. Please tell me what I need to do. And they'll tell you, they'll tell you over the phone and they'll send you a written response too, if you'd like one. This service is also available through the Think HR mobile app, so you can do all of this stuff on the fly. You can see here at the bottom, there's a lot of different services and tools that are made available through the Think HR platform. Last but not least is a benefits resource center. So basically, um, this is a group of USI trained um, employees who are up to speed on all 16 plans that are being offered. Um, by the chamber. Once your plan is selected and you're enrolled, basically your group will have access to these people um, to basically be a resource to your members that they can call after hours or during hours with questions regarding anything related to the group health insurance plan. So as you know, spouses often have questions, um, you know, members have questions after hours. This is a great resource for that. So. Went those, through those very quickly. I know we're running very short on time, but I do want to open it up for any questions. Um, one thing that I will uh, um, suggest or make aware is USI is not the um, loan consultant who's promoting the program. Any benefits consultant, agent, or broker who is a Wichita Chamber member can actually facilitate um, this offering to their clients as well. They just need to be a chamber member. Jamie? Yeah, thank you for saying that. So I think um, the next step for any employer that's interested in learning more about the program or perhaps um, initiating the quoting process is to either reach out to your current consultant or uh, to Rick or Brett Emerson with Providers Care. Um, all of that information is on the Chamber's website at wichitachamber.org backslash health insurance. Um, so we'll be in contact with you, uh, with you all with more information um, as after this wraps up. Rick, do you have any closing comments for the group? I just want to thank everybody for their time and joining us today. Obviously, this will be recorded, so I went through a lot of that stuff very quickly. Um, once this recording's posted, obviously use it as a resource. Don't hesitate to reach out to me or Brett Emerson directly with any questions. Um, we want to answer your questions. Um, there's a lot going on inside these programs because they are unique, but we're more than happy to help facilitate any questions you may have. And I look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you about exploring this um, at your upcoming renewal or so maybe even sooner if possible. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning, Rick. Rick we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to talking with everyone more soon. Have awesome. a great day, everyone. Thank you.